right now. Yes. Hello, Dan. Absolutely. How are Hello. you? Hello. Start from the very beginning. Where were you born? Where are you from? What's your story? Well, I was born in Ashland, Ohio. Um, that's a real and, place, uh, right? You're not making that up. That's a real place, okay. yes. I've been a musician since I was five years old. I remember standing on a milk crate at the church pulpit next to my father, who was a reverend and church pastor, and my mother was at the piano. Uh, we were a trio, and I sang the soprano part. Uh, at that time, the Blackwood Brothers Gospel Quartet sang at the church, and the music made a huge impression on me. I found out later that they were Elvis Presley's favorite group. I began playing the piano at age 10 years old and probably performed at least a thousand times as a soloist, a member of uh, various choirs and other ensembles. There were one-man shows and I played in rock bands. I began writing music professionally at the age of 19. There's another poor man who lives down the street who doesn't have the money for new shoes on his feet. He works hard each day to earn his wage. It seems that life is a surrounding cage. And when I see the confusion all around us, I know that this is nothing. You Talking to Dan Nelman Nicewander. Uh, but it's it nice wonder. Just think nice and wander. It's, nice wander. It, my Swiss grandfather. Did I say didn't nice speak wander? English. I think I said it's nice something wander. like that. It's very okay. easy to mispronounce. I just it's said okay. it in the moment. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You were being okay. spontaneous. I worked as a background actor in Hollywood TV shows and films, and worked on various film projects, and uh, taught English in Japan while in California in my twenties. Um, when I was back east in Indianapolis, Indiana, and in the Midwest. I recorded two professional albums. I've always been in a music family. Mm -hmm. Your music's been the thing I've done longer than anything else in my life. When I first went out to the Los Angeles area in my 20s, and it was the 80s and the early 90s, um, I did write quite a bit of music. It was a very prolific period for me, uh, particularly in the, uh, the late 80s and um, the early 90s. And I... Um, jammed with a lot of people, did, you know, one, one off projects with, with, with various people. Um, but the two musicians I worked with the most was a drummer, JJ originally from St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, guitarist El Tal from North Hollywood. So El had some original songs, but the vast majority of the demos were my compositions. And um, we tried to meet other musicians, put a band together and nothing really gelled, but we had a lot of great creative work together. And uh, Elle and I are still great friends to this day. And I won't go into the story of why I went back uh, to Indiana, uh, but that's a whole other story. One of the things that I'm here to do in this Earth experience, I guess you could say, um, that was to make not only music, but to do it professionally all the way. I met um, a, a producer engineer in the Indianapolis area and um, introduced to me from an, another musician in the area. And uh, I had some new songs I was working on um, after coming out of a very difficult time in my life. And I went into the studio. I worked with some of the best studio musicians um, in central Indiana. Uh, Dane Clark from the John Mellencamp Band, who had just joined the Mellencamp Band like six months before. Also, um, Randy Melson, who was a bass player, worked a lot with uh, the gospel singer Sandy Patty, who I knew from college days, and also did a lot of orchestrations and, uh, for her. And then Charlie Smith, a great uh, uh, jazz guitar player uh, in uh, central Indiana. Uh, he, he was quite versatile as well as a virtuoso. He could play rock and roll, but he, at the time he was mostly doing jazz and he, uh, he did some great solo work, particularly. Um, 
uh, on uh, three songs that we did. One which ended up on um, Revolution of the Heart, which was a chameleon. And David Pretty was the uh, producer and the engineer was Glenn Scott. And so a three song demo was complete. Um, and I was calling myself Daniel Lyon, L-Y-O-N, basically as a kind of a solo artist, but also writer, right? With the idea of maybe, you know, other artists could record, you know, songs that I write, um, which I'm still interested in. Uh, there's one particular song of those three uh, to this day. Um, but as it progressed, I uh, lived in Indianapolis, Indiana. I met the Johnson brothers. Um, Eric Klee and Mark Johnson, who were twin brothers, that co-owned a studio in uh, the Broad Ripple area of Indianapolis. It's called Rev Recording, a basement studio with dat tape, a dat tape, and uh, so the next thing I know, I've got uh, this the equipment that I had purchased to make a lot of demos uh, in California, kind of a sequencing daisy chain of you know, equipment, you know, uh, and a lot of electronic kind of uh, produced songs came together. Um, and I started recording those. Um, and, and then I had written some other songs that really needed live musicians, as I had done originally with the first session that I'd done with David and Glenn uh, in another studio. And I wrote this song called Surfing with Jesus. Uh, I wrote uh, uh, I took a song that I had written as a teenager in Indiana, uh, one of the first, what I would consider professional songs I ever wrote called Out of Order. And um, those were recorded uh, with uh, Eric and Mark and other musicians in the, in, in the Indianapolis kind of broad ripple scene there. I also worked with um, a percussionist, uh, Raul Pedro, who uh, I worked with uh, in my daytime job uh, for quite a few years, and uh, he was a professional a percussion, percussion player, also a drummer, and he played congas on Something's Happening Here. And the next thing I know, I mean, there's a full-length album, you know, there was a lot going on. Uh, because I did have to work a so-called regular job to pay the bills, right? And in the evenings, I would, you know, be in the music scene or be recording or writing or whatever. And eventually, when I had the album, I had a CD release party. Uh, Steve Hammer from Nouveau News Weekly gave it a, a great review. And um, I was playing uh, open mics, uh, uh, you know, starting with, you know, 10 minute sets and expanding to like 20 minutes and half an hour. And then I would get invited to do a full length show, um, opening for other bands in, um, in clubs. And, um, and, and I would do surfing with Jesus and karaoke and just to try it out in different places. People loved it. I sang at unity churches in the area. Um, and, uh, they loved, uh, cause I made a variety of different music. And it, it was just, it just grew. I mean, people would come out to shows. Uh, it got to a point where I was playing a, a solo show and I was the main attraction. Then I was offered um, to host a variety show once a month at a brand new nightclub called Birdies Live. And I would do the one man show there. I began doing uh, my own original variety show at Birdies uh, called Mystery Monday. It includes music and comedy, video, I've had a magician, ballet dancer, it's variety. And now it's my privilege to bring back to the stage one of my Mystery Monday favorites right here, Mr. Brian Archer, ladies and gentlemen. We actually received recognition from the office of George Harrison after a tribute show. And we can even say that Prince was a mystery guest. You know, I was pissed off about the whole Prince thing because I wanted to see Nice Wonder. Where it started out with the one song at my karaoke show and then I heard a CD and then 
and I got to witness it as it progressed, and it's uh, it's unlike anything else anybody would ever have an opportunity to experience here, perhaps anywhere, and probably the most entertaining night you could go out and just have. But when the band came, it just blew me away even more so. And there's little else that anybody in this town has the opportunity to experience live that is comparable <laughs> to a nice wonder show. This is Birdie's um, Bar and Grill. You see the sign over here. Um, in Indianapolis, Indiana, for three years I had a monthly variety show here from 2001 to 2004 and many memorable nights a lot of theme nights we had um, a beach night we had a uh, girls night out we had British night which was very popular all British music um, a TV night um, what else girls girls night out I mentioned that right yeah and uh, it was so much fun dance night Irish night, and speaking of Irish night, in March of 2002, we uh, had to stop the show and let Prince and New Power Generation play a late night set, which was a benefit for, uh, I guess, a uh, shelter in uh, Minneapolis. And they were playing Indianapolis that night at the Marat Temple earlier, and it was the last show of their tour, I guess. So they pulled the buses in here into the parking lot, did the show. Uh, they left probably about 4.30 in the morning and then uh, went to Minneapolis uh, from here. That's what I understood. So, And uh, it was a great night. Uh, they played an hour and a half in the middle of the night. <laughs> um, but obviously uh, the show was called Mystery Monday, so I always had a mystery guest. So I was able to get some press from that. You know, like, wow, we had quite an incredible mystery guest um, that night. But it was so much fun and uh, many, many memories here doing regular shows as well with the band uh, as part of showcases and just regular nights with other bands. How I came up with the artist name Nice Wonder, well, of course, that's my, my so-called birth last name. Um, and at this particular job where Ra Raul and I had worked together and also uh, Eric Clee Johnson, the three of us, that's how we met. Um, who was one of the uh, producers on both of my albums, a great friend and also a great musician. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, a, a co-owner with his twin brother of um, the Rev Recording Studio and then later uh, the, the, the digital Pro Tools Studio, uh, the Pop Machine, where I recorded my second album, Adventures in Wonderland. Anyway, uh, we were all working together. We met at this, this same company. Uh, in the, the late 90s and I was in, in training for my position and um, the uh, the trainer mentioned to me you know uh, that she, I mean, she knew I was a musician because I talked about that and she said there is a guy that was in the previous training class that, that will be probably on your team or will be out there on the floor it turned out to be on my same team he said, you guys are going to hit it off. Sure enough, we did. And we, like I said, we worked together on both of my albums and are very good friends to this day. Um, but I was trying to come up with an artist name because I didn't know Daniel Lyon, you know, L-Y-O-N. I don't know if I wanted to use that name or not. And then I remember walking down the hallway and this trainer, she said, nice wonder. Oh, I never heard somebody call out my last name like that. So I thought... That actually has a ring to it. That became my artist name. The album itself, Revolution of the Heart, I came up with the title because of, of a lecture I went to when I was in, still living in California, by a, uh, a DJ um, by the name of Frank Sontag, who had started on radio, uh, basically being a you know sound operator for uh, Michael Brenner, who had a late night radio show. And um, on the KLOS uh, in Los Angeles. And he eventually went on to take over the, the um, 
the late night slot from Michael Brenner, his show he called Impact. Well, he also ran the board for the the morning show uh, Monday through Friday uh, on KLOS uh, FM that was called the Mark and Brian Show. And he would do public lectures because he had uh, this um, this in interest not only in connecting with his audience on the Impact Show, which was a, a basically a late night, middle of the night a radio program uh, early Monday morning on KLOS that I often would, you know, uh, you know, listen to and not get very much sleep before a work day. Uh, and I sometimes would call in on his show and talk to him and, and, and he had a lot of very interesting topics. He played a lot of very interesting music that you wouldn't necessarily hear during the day on the radio. The topics would range everything from like spiritual uh, to like political. Uh, and uh, it was um, it was inspiring. And then, and then he did public lectures um, where he would invite his listeners to come out and he would speak on a topic that he was passionate about. And one of the lectures he did was called Revolution of the Heart. And I thought, wow, that's a very interesting title for an album, right? Um, and... Uh, one of the songs, that, one of the lead-off songs on the album, Feel the Feeling, actually, I started the song uh, by saying, you know, uh, as the world is turning, I feel my heart beating. Uh, and I realized that that had come from the idea of revolution of the heart. So I thought, perfect title. Uh, he even agreed to uh, allow me to sample him saying revolution of the heart. Uh, for the opening track of the album, which was called Before the Beginning. As this world is turning, I feel my heart beating. I'm alive. Like the ancient rhythm of the drum, do I know where I've come from? Or where I'm going? When I was living here, this apartment complex, um, I wrote uh, Surfing with Jesus, uh, which became a, a crowd favorite in Indianapolis uh, for, let's see, from about 19, well, the late 90s to about the mid 2000s, um, but I wrote it here. If Jesus were here today, would he want to go surfing? Do you think that he would play beach volleyball? Wear a neat pair of sandals and a cool set of shades. Got it all figured out, cause he knows all. Surfing, oh, oh, oh. surfing with Jesus, surfing. Whoa, oh, oh. in this location. Uh, in Broad Ripple of Indianapolis. Um, I lived here. So I definitely wrote songs for both of my albums, Revolution of the Heart and Adventures in Wonderland, in that room right there. And uh, yeah, this is the house. And um, where were you on 9-11? As projects like this are, all the ideas kind of flowed together. And the idea that I had was that it was going to be an underground kind of album. But and at least I'm kind of that kind of person. I mean, I, I'm very inspired by artists that would not necessarily, you know, do the predictable thing in making a com what we'd call a commercial album. But as it went on, I realized, well, you know, I shouldn't limit myself, right? So some of this material that I'm writing actually is what I would call accessible, or let's say it could be commercial, but I liked using the term accessible, right? So I thought, you know. I can still have the vibe of an underground album, but have some material on it that I would definitely call accessible and maybe even commercial. So that was the the general vibe of, that I wanted to create, and and be you know, capture that moment of my life that I was experiencing. Revolution of the Heart was released in 1999. Stop. 
story of a woman. This is the story of a man. And the feeling that they share is that they really care about everyone. With the rich or poor, the heart is an open door for good. They understand compassion. As more and more people became aware of what I was doing, I was getting uh, some radio airplay, and, and David Lindquist, from, uh, who was the uh, music uh, reviewer uh, at the Indianapolis Star newspaper, wrote a great review, and basically my act. Um, and it, it just, just blew up from there. And people were coming up to me and wanting to play in a band with me, and I thought, oh, I will, you know, combine my songs with other people's songs, and we'll do kind of like, you know, what most bands do. I mean, that, that where they have multiple writers, you know, and then we'll all produce music together. I thought that's how it would go, you know, kind of like the Beatles or Queen. And but people say, no, no, your music's great. We just want to play your music. We have our other projects. We want to play your music. Um, and, um, and I did bring a different angle to the uh, the shows, the, to the, the vibe of, of the music scene there. Terry Noki, who had a karaoke show, one of the, the places where I would go to sing Surfing with Jesus, you know, and always get a, a, an excellent crowd response. And that song created quite a, a vibe in the area. So as time went on, a band formed and uh, played many shows, played live on, on TV, uh, uh, Fox 59 Morning News. It was such an exciting time to be part of a, of a music scene that was very vibrant in the early 2000s. So here, here it is, I, I produced an album and released it before the end of the 20th century. It was quite a magical time. Or, whatever the, the word would be to try to describe it. Sometimes I, I don't have the words. It was amazing, it was wonderful, it was enlightening, exciting. I worked with so many great musicians. It would take me a long time to, to mention all their names, but um, uh, I'll list them in the credits. Um, and I, so many wonderful friends there, club owners there, uh, and as I mentioned, people in the media, Fox 59, News, also the radio stations, um, X103 and WFBQ, uh, WTTS based out of Bloomington, Indiana, uh, and again Steve Hammer, uh, Dave Lindquist, um, IndianapolisMusic.net, uh, Matt Fetcher, Jeff Sample, who was also in the band and played an instrumental role uh, in so many different ways. Well, I started calling it Rocktronica when I first Whoa. started doing the solo act, but it kind of evolves over time. You know, I'm, I'm one of those never-ending, changing people, so reinventing that. myself. Ooh, we've heard that. 
Yeah, you've heard that. We've heard you've that heard you're, that. some people say, a little crazy, very entertaining, not sure the exact word to describe you. How do you describe yourself? That sounds pretty close. Okay. <laughs> There's always more to come. Enlightenment of the heart. Lights on in a better home. Lights on somebody's home. Lights on in a one home. Lights on somebody's home. Present always. And stay tuned. Thank you very much. But Dan, never give up. Absolutely. We're getting ready to change the world. So uh, stay tuned. <laughs>